Because we're about to move right into chapter 8. Okay? Now, look what he says as he opens up this chapter. Now, of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. You go, oh, you got to be kidding. He's going to summarize everything that he just talked about? I thought you said he did that in the very last verse. I did. I did. Notice point A before we go there. Chapter 7 of Hebrews ended with a discussion involving the contrast between the Levitical priesthood and the priesthood of Melchizedek. Remember, four contrasts were given, right? And then he says what he says. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. It sounds like he's about to summarize everything. Folks, that's why you have got to look up what? definitions of words. You would just think, oh, okay, he's going to summarize everything he just talked about. I'll just pass over this section. Don't you do that. Don't you do that. Look at the definition of the word sum. Principal thing. That is main point. Chief or main point. Principal things. Folks, the writer is about to present the most important point of everything that he has presented. Okay, here's the way the American Standard Version puts it. In the things which we are saying, the chief point is this. What he's about to give us is another what? Another contrast. And this one, in his mind, is what? This is the principal one. This is the chief one. This is the most important of all of them. Now, that sounds like a man writing, doesn't it? But who said it? The Holy Spirit of God said it. The Holy Spirit says that this is the chief point right here. And guys, what's interesting, look at the title of this particular section. I, I, I separated it out from the others because it's its own, isn't it? It's the principal one. He's contrasting Jesus... Being a high priest in the true tabernacle versus the Levitical priests who were priests in the earthly tabernacle. Man. Now guys, I'm telling you, the people out here in the world, there is absolutely no way they can understand what he's teaching right here. Why do I say that? Anybody have a clue why I say that? Because they don't understand the church. That's why. If you don't understand the church, then you can't understand the true tabernacle. Okay? Because it's part of what? The true tabernacle. Okay? And we're going to talk about it. It's just, uh, man, unbelievable. Notice point C. The chief point involves a contrast between the places wherein the two priesthoods minister. One is earthly in a tabernacle made with hands. The other is heavenly in the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, and not who? And not man. He says this is the primary contrast. This is the most important contrast of them all. I find it interesting that Hebrews 6a, he's going to conclude this little section, and he says this, But now hath he, that's Jesus, obtained a what? a more excellent ministry. Folks, the reason his ministry is more excellent is because of where it is executed. Okay? It is not executed where? On earth. It's executed in the true, sanctu the true uh, tabernacle. The sanctuary of God. The heavenly sanctuary. And he says this is the most important point of all of them. Man. In these five, five and a half verses, there are a lot of contrasts made. And I just set them out for you so you could see them. Because you have to kind of read over and over the section to get the contrast. But they're in there. Okay? Notice the contrast. Melchizedek's priesthood. The priest sits where? On the right hand of God. Where does God dwell right now? In heaven. <laughs> That's where our high priest is. Where did the high priest dwell who was under the Levitical priesthood on earth in the city of 
Jerusalem, ultimately, didn't he? So which do you want? You want a priest in heaven? You want a priest on earth? i just take the one in heaven. Thank you. <laughs> Secondly, he is in a heavenly sanctuary. What kind of tabernacle did they have here on earth? An old earthly tabernacle. Do you all remember uh, Sunday we were talking about the sons of Eli, right? We didn't get all the way through that chapter, and I, I hate that because we just leave some things behind, okay? Uh, but there, there's another sin in which the sons of Eli participate. Does anybody remember what it is? They, we talked about how they sinned with regard to the sacrifices, but they also committed another heinous sin. What did they do? Anybody know? Yeah, they slept with the women at the door of the tabernacle. Here's the, here's the question. Who are these women? Why are they there? Well, what's that? They were always there. Um, folks, it appears that the priest hired women to work on the tabernacle. What do women do pretty well? No, no, no. <laughs> So, so, you've got, you've got a tabernacle made of what? Cloth, don't you? They're just curtains. Now guys, this tabernacle, you know, sometime in our mind, I think we think it was set up for just a few years. No, this tabernacle existed for a long time, didn't it? Okay? By the time the children of Israel got into the promised land throughout the whole period of the judges, all the way to the reign of David, almost to the end of David's reign, before that tabernacle finally got set up where? In the city of Jerusalem. So it was just made of what? Curtains, just made of cloth. Well, guess what happens to cloth? It rips, it tears, it needs repair. So guess what they did? They hired women to do what? Work on and sew and take care of the tabernacle. So here's a bunch of women available to who? The priests. And so what do they do? They lie with them at the door of the tabernacle. Wow. Okay? Because you see, that was an earthly what? Tabernacle. See? That's why those women were, is an earthly tabernacle. But we have a what kind of tabernacle? A heavenly tabernacle, don't we? And guess what it's constructed of? It's not constructed of tents. It's constructed of humans, partially, which are who? Us. Are we clothed in a tent? For if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. <laughs> Folks, the holy place is still constructed of a tent. And it's the tent of our human bodies as members of what? Of the church. Wow. Okay? It's pretty interesting, isn't it? Notice... Melchizedek's tabernacle not made with what? Not made with hands. But folks, guess what? That old tabernacle was made with hands, wasn't it? Okay. You and I became part of the tabernacle of God when we converted, didn't we? Okay. But that conversion did not come about because of man. It came about because of a new birth, didn't it? A spiritual birth brought about through God. Notice that's the true sanctuary that Jesus ministers under. The sanctuary that the Levitical priesthood operated under was one that was a shadow and an example. Wasn't a real thing. Did they make the temple pretty elaborate? I've been reading a version from my Bible reading this year called The Message. I don't like that book, but um, we're, we just finished the section where David is preparing... For the, tabern for the temple to be built, okay? Uh, he didn't get to build it, did he? And it's going to replace what? The temple is going to replace what? The tabernacle. 
Okay, David, David built him this nice, fancy, elaborate palace to live in. And then one day he looks out and he sees what? Ah, look at that's the house of God. And it's just a what? It's just a tent. And I'm over here dwelling in a palace. So I want to make God a what? I want to make God a temple. And God said, uh-uh, not you, because you're a man of what? You're a man of war. You've shed too much blood. So I'm going to let who do it? Solomon. But folks, here's what's interesting. And you can go back and read it. The one thing David had in his mind, this is going to be the most elaborate structure that has ever been constructed. And when Solomon built that temple, guess what? It was glorious. Did that temple ever get destroyed? Solomon's temple? When? Anybody know? When? Yeah, the Babylonian captivity, remember? There were three carryings away. Nebuchadnezzar entered into the city of Jerusalem three different times. 606, 587, 586. And he eventually totally annihilated Solomon's temple. It was rebuilt in the days of Zerubbabel, wasn't it? Okay, after the 70-year captivity, the children of Israel come back to the city of Jerusalem. That temple's rebuilt. And there were individuals who had seen Solomon's temple, and there were individuals who now see Zerubbabel's temple, and guess what they do? They cry. You want to know why? The glory of the second did not compare to the glory of the first one. You see, in their mind, we're going to make an unbelievable structure. Okay? But guys, it was still just a what? A shadow. It was just an example of the heavenly tabernacle. It didn't matter how elaborate it was. It still falls way short of the one that we have. The other one was under, was under the law. Therefore, Jesus couldn't have even been a priest, could He? This one... The priests offer gifts according to the law. Okay, so, uh, it, it, you know, one, Jesus couldn't have been a priest under, and uh, there were, they, he, he would have just had to serve under the Levitical priesthood. Notice he has a what? More excellent ministry. Did the Levitical priest have a ministry? Yes. yes. It was a ministry, but Jesus is a more excellent ministry. See, all of those contrasts are found in those five little verses. Wow, it's pretty powerful stuff. Questions or comments? None. Man. All right. We're going to run through this particular section, and we're going to talk about first His power. Okay? His power. Notice what He says. Now, of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on what? The right hand of the throne of... I want you to listen to this title of the majesty in the heavens. Underline the majesty. God is the majesty. Okay? We'll talk about it. Notice that we've already talked about the principal part point, so I'm not going to go back to that. Notice his pos the position of the high priest. We have such a what? High priest. We, folks, we have... At that time, it was present tense. We have right now. We have. We as Christians have. And guess what? We still have. Don't we? Yes. We have a high priest. Man, I, I, I hope you hold that in your minds. Okay? You leave out of here. You go to bed. You pray tonight. Thank God we have the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. You pray that prayer. Okay, because it's a far superior priesthood. Uh, and we need to let others know that we have that. Notice his exaltation. Okay, he, he, it's, a, it's in existence. Notice his exaltation. Who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Folks, this is not the first time that we are told in the book of Hebrews that Jesus sits where? On the right hand of God. He almost in, opens the book with it. Hebrews 1 verse 3 who being in the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person and upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of what? The majesty on high. Wow. See, He's already talked about this. 
He's letting us know where Jesus is, isn't He? Where is He, folks? He's on the right hand of the majesty on high. A place of authority and honor. Barnes says, the meaning is that He is exalted to the highest honor in the universe. He occupies the most exalted situation in heaven. Ephesians 1, 20 and 21, which He wrought in Christ Jesus when He raised Him from the dead and set Him at His own right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Man. Guys, there's no, no one higher than who? Than our precious Lord. He sat down right on the right hand of who? The majesty in the heavens. The majesty. I'm going to talk about it real quick in the bell ring probably. The ma Folks, God is the majesty. Who do we usually refer to as your majesty? Yeah. A queen or a king. We enter in, we say, Hello, your majesty. What do we mean by that? Well, the definition is there. Greatness. In this case, it means divinity. Vine says it denotes greatness, majesty, signifying His greatness and dignity. But I want you to see something. Notice point two. Notice that God does not just possess greatness. He is greatness. He sat down on the right hand of the majesty in the heavens. The what? <clears throat> the greatness in the heavens. Folks, it's more than he just possesses greatness. He is what? He is greatness. Now guess what? We ain't nothing. Isn't that right? All our righteousness is as filthy garments, isn't it? There's nothing great about us. That little child, I got to thinking about this. What's, what's the a prayer that a little child learns very early on? What's the very first prayer he learns, probably? Yes, let us thank him for our food. You know, we just kind of run through that. Did you hear that first statement? God is great. Now, a little child may not understand that, but a parent needs to teach him that. God is great. He doesn't just possess greatness. He is what? He is great. Folks, it's unbelievable when we talk about who we're serving. Okay? And Jesus is sitting where? Right next to Him. If you sit on the right hand of the King, buddy, you are something. You know that? No doubt. In verse 2, he's going to talk about his position. A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched, and not who? And not man. Folks, if, if you're a part of something that a man has built, then guess what? You are not a part of the true sanctuary. That needs to be taught to our denominational friends. You know that? The Lord's church was not built by who? Alexander Campbell, Thomas Campbell, Barton W. Stone, none of those men. The Lord's church was pitched by who? By Jesus. If you're part of a man-made organization, folks, let me tell you something. You need to get out of it and get in a sanctuary, the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched, and not man. Whew. Give you chills. Thank you, thank you.